Professor Timothy Williamson, why did you decide to study analytic philosophy? Well, I first got interested in philosophy when I was about 14. Uh, I read some interviews with contemporary philosophers working in Britain, people like A.J. Eyre, Peter Strawson, Karl Popper. I mean, of course, they, they were analytic philosophers, but I didn't know what they were. I just thought of them as philosophers, and I thought that the way they were thinking was an interesting way that came quite naturally to me. And at the same time, I was interested in some questions in, in logic, and so I, I went on to study mathematics and philosophy at, at Oxford. So the, the philosophy I was studying was predominantly analytic philosophy, but at the time I wasn't aware of having a choice between analytic philosophy and non-analytic philosophy. It was, I just thought I was doing philosophy. And then gradually I became aware that there were these other schools of philosophy in the world that were being studied in other countries. And when I started doing my graduate work, I was curious uh, to see what some of these people were talking about. So I read some, some Derrida and Foucault and other postmodernist philosophers and, and went to meetings of a, a radical philosophy group that was concerned to, to discuss their works. And what I found was that, that when I started making objections to what they were saying, partly in order to try to find out what, what they really meant, that nobody seemed to be very interested in answering the objections. They, they were more inclined just to, to dismiss them. And while at first I, I thought that the other people in the group understood these philosophers much better than I did, I gradually came to the conclusion, partly because they, they weren't able to give any clear answers to my objections that they didn't really understand them any better than I did. They were simply more willing to, to talk that way. So I, as I went on, I became more and more convinced that there wasn't any effective way of, of clarifying what they were saying, that it was as obscure as it, it seemed. And I came to the conclusion that they really didn't have anything very useful to offer me that would that would help me to understand the things I wanted to understand. So in that way, in uh, at that second stage, when once I was aware of the alternative of non-analytic philosophy, when when I had a look at it, I find it very unsatisfying. And I, th I think one thing that I've found in in my experience of philosophy is, is that analytic philosophy is, is much less hierarchical in the sense that when the most famous analytic philosopher in the world uh, goes to, uh, to give a talk in, in some place and a humble student asks them a tricky question, they're expected to treat the question with respect and to give it a proper answer. And if they're unable to do so, if they just brush the the question aside or, or try to bullshit their way out of it, then that will be noticed and, and people will think less of them because they were, they were not able to, to deal well with the, the question. Whereas in my experience, non-analytic philosophers are much more likely to appeal to their authority and, and simply refuse to answer questions from people that they don't regard as high enough up in, in the hierarchy to, to have the right to, to ask such questions. So that al although you, you hear much more of the, the rhetoric of liberation within what sometimes called continental philosophy, um, actually continental philosophy uh, operates in a much more authoritarian way than analytic philosophy does. Uh, would you say that postmodern philosophy and in general the world vision uh, behind contemporary uh, social science reacts uh, to talk about truth uh, because there is a confusion be between truth and certainty? And if you think so, why do you think that it is that way? Well, yes, I, th I think there is such a, a confusion in, in a lot of contemporary 
thinking. And you can see that, that it's there because they tend to think that anybody who speaks of truth is committed to some kind of dogmatism and intolerance. Of course, it, dogmatism and intolerance are, are bad things, but they're not things that you're committed to by believing in truth. They're things that you're committed to by uh, believing in, in certainty. But perhaps even, not even certainty, but at least if, if you're certain of things, then you can rest much more on them than if you're, than if you're uncertain of them. And I, I think one can understand to some extent why people make the confusion, because they think, well, if, if you're concerned with truth, you're, you're making truth claims, and how can you make a truth claim unless you're certain of the truth? It's, they're, they're thinking something along those lines. But one can distinguish between truth and certainty using quite elementary considerations. So, I mean, here's a, a very simple uh, example. I mean, can, consider the number of, of spiders in this room. It's either odd or even. We, haven't, we don't know how many spiders there are. But whatever, however many there are, it's either an odd number or an even number. And if it's an odd number, then it, it's true that it's an odd number. And if it's an, e an even number, then it's true that it's an even number. So one way or the other, uh, there is a truth. But since we're completely uncertain as to whether the number is odd or even, uh, th there is no certainty either way. So wh whichever of those two propositions, that, that the number is odd or that the number is even, whichever of the two propositions is true, it's not certain. And so one way or the other, there's an example of truth without certainty. Um, so just in that fairly straightforward, commonsensical way, it's possible to see that there's a huge difference between uh, truth and certainty. And I, I think also such common sense examples are a good indication of how really modest the claim is that, that, there are, that some things are true and, are, and others are false. It, it's not something for which you require any huge authority. It's just something that it's possible to reason to, but by these elementary considerations, and these elementary considerations are obviously entirely consistent with, with being very aware of one's own fallibility and undogmatic and, and tolerant of other points of view. Unfortunately, I think quite a lot of contemporary theoretical discourse proceeds in an atmosphere of pretentious abstraction in which it's considered naive and illegitimate to make these, these very simple arguments of the kind that I've illustrated. Um, and if somebody does try to, to make, th make them, they're, they're simply dismissed as not understanding the, the depth of the, the issue. Um, and really, that is not because people who are dismissing such uh, objections have any coherent explanation of what's wrong with them. Um, I, you know, I think to some extent it, it, one can compare it to the, uh, the story of the emperor who had no, no clothes, where it, it, uh, he was naked, but um, all his courtiers treated him as wonderfully dressed until the little boy comes along and points out that the emperor has no clothes. I think um, it's a matter of them having internalized their own confusion so that they're, uh, I mean, they're like the courtiers who have really convinced themselves that in a deep sense the, the emperor is dressed in magnificent clothes and, and they probably have a, a court philosopher whose job is to explain how it's only on a very naive and unsophisticated understanding that you, you would suppose that clothes are the kind of uh, thing that, uh, that you can see or, or touch, that uh, in the deep sense of clothes, the, the emperor is, is wearing more clothes 
uh, than anyone else. And uh, unfortunately, one, I mean, once you have a whole community that's uh, emotionally and intellectually and culturally invested in nonsense of, of that kind, uh, it's, it's very difficult to help it in, into any kind of clarification. And uh, of course, what will happen in such a community when the little boy says that the emperor has no clothes uh, is that he will be told to shut up and that uh, he hasn't studied enough philosophy and when he's older he will understand that the emperor has more clothes than anybody else. Thank you.